Karen from ediblewildfood.com here and today's video is about fleabane and lots of it. Okay, so this in here, it's either the common or the daisy fleabane. And the reason why I don't know 100% the difference, I'll get to in just a little bit. But the scientific name for this is Rigeron anus or anus. Uh, let's get focused in here. That would help, wouldn't it? Hang on. There we go. Okay. So these are an annual plant in the Asteracea family. During a good season, these can be overabundant. And in this specific area, they certainly are. And in a poor season, they can be actually almost non-existent, which is typical of annual plants. These guys bloom late spring and they can bloom straight into the autumn. And right now it's around mid-August or so. And you can tell that a lot of the heavy rains that we've had have done a number on this area. We have Queen Anne's Lace in here, Brown Eyed Susans. However, that's not what this is about. It's about the fleabane. There are over 50 different species of Erigeron across North America. Quite impressive, actually. The common fleabane is Erigeron anus. I think I mentioned that. And the daisy fleabane is Erigeron strigosis. And as I mentioned, it is kind of tricky to tell the two apart. The daisy fleabane tends to have fewer and more slender leaves than the annual. And in this mess, it's kind of hard to tell. But here we go there. So really, unless you have both species together, it's really difficult to tell. And the upper to mid, I would say the middle to the upper stems tend to be a little bit more hairy with the annual flea bane. I believe it's the annual flea bane. But again, the two of them are so extremely close in appearance, it's so difficult to tell them apart. Now these ones, of course, that you're looking at, these are the mature plant. But what do they look like when they're, when they're young? This is a really good example of new growth which species of fleabane, I don't know specifically, it's coming up through my interlocking brick. I've got tons and tons of container gardens happening here. Anyway, as you can see, the leaf structure is much different to that of the mature leaves where they're elliptical. These are definitely not. They're lobed a little bit, just slightly. And that is what you're looking for if you want just young growth. What you're looking at is horseweed. And horseweed I have a video about. I'll put the link to that below. But horseweed is in the fleabane family technically. It's known as Coniza canadensis or Origeron or canadensis. The leaf structure is much, much thinner. And these have a little bit of heat to them when you taste them. I love them much better than the other flea beans. But this just shows you another comparison of a flea bane member. These dainty flowers are quite impressive. They have dozens of central disc florets. 
They're extremely tiny, and that is the yellow that you're looking at. And they're surrounded by anywhere from 50 to 120 white ray florets. Both the common and the daisy species have white petals, although there are other species that are white. But these two species in particular, as they begin to age, they become somewhat pinkish. Throughout the United States, there is another type of fleabane, Erigeron purpuratus, and of course they have lavender or purplish kind of flowers. They're more common in the States than here in Canada. But it seems that pretty much most of the fleabane species grow anywhere between one and four feet tall. These ones here are definitely in the four foot range, if not higher. And each one of these will produce a huge amount of seeds. In fact, one plant can produce 100,000 seeds. And when they're released, they're released by wind and the water. But this is amazing food for our American goldfinches, ground finches, and sparrows. They love the seeds. But unfortunately, there are not any right here. I'll take a peek uh, in a bit to see if I can find some. And if I can find the seeds, I'll let you have a peek yourself. And if not, I apologize. I guess we'd have to look at some images. I brought this to my backpack and obviously a little visitor as well. And this is most definitely the daisy fleabane and the reason why I say that is because you can see that there are that the hairs on this are so incredibly tiny they're barely visible I can feel them but you can barely see them so having said that the annual fleabane the hairs on the upper stems where you're looking at right now are long and they're spreading so definitely the species that we're looking at today are the daisy fleabanes So this plant over the years, and I mean hundreds of years, has developed so many different myths and legends. And perhaps the most two common ones are that it repels bugs. And the other one is that it keeps evil spirits away or it keeps evil spells away. Now, hmm, if this really were true, I think our society could use a massive amount of this plant right now. Early American settlers burned or dried this plant and kept it in their satchels to repel annoying insects. And apparently they even stuffed their mattresses and hung it in hopes to keep bugs away. However, there doesn't really seem to appear to be any evidence that it is a true repellent since pollinators are attracted to the flower. The area that I'm in right now, trust me, I'm getting eaten alive by the mosquitoes right now. It's not working. Now, I've even tried to dry this and burn it to see if it can repel anything. I've had no luck. Have you done it? And have you had any luck with bug repellent at all using this plant? I would suspect the, the lighter color that you see on these leaves is a result of too much water. It seems like we have one or two days of beautiful weather and then it rains for three or four days. However, let's get back to the information about this plant. And there is a lot of recorded information of how the Native Americans use this in so many different ways. Now, they've used fleabane. Now, which specific variety? I can't say off the top of my head, but I do know that the Lakotas made tea for children, and apparently it helped with uh, if they had a sore mouth, and adults would drink the tea if they had urination issues. The Navajo used the plant to make, um, I believe it was a tea, or I think maybe it was a bit of a, a lotion for headaches and body pains. 
and the Cherokee used the root right here. They would use the root to help with coughs and apparently bad vision as well. Now, in the amazing book, Native American Ethnobotany by Mormon, he wrote... Actually, he wrote a lot, and I certainly can't be reading this all off. But what you can do is pause the video so you can read this. And he wrote a lot more, actually, because there are several species that he has addressed in this fabulous book. Quite a lot. So there we go. What is this book? This is the one. It is so well worth it. It is really thick. It's huge. And it's rather expensive, though, if uh, you're on a budget, because it's roughly 50 or $60. But if you're into research, it certainly is well worth its weight in gold. According to the Eclectic School of Herbal Medicine, flebane is a stimulant with antimicrobial, diuretic, and astringent properties. There we go. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. And in some websites, I've even seen that if you make a tea with this, it can help with rheumatism. Now, whether this is true or not, I'm not 100% sure. I haven't had a chance to validate that. But if that's the case, that is a bonus for those who have rheumatism. Like any produce in the grocery store, you always want to make sure that you pick the best looking produce. Some of the leaves here are okay. Some are not. I can only surmise that these leaves are the color that they are because of the heavy rains that we've had here. Anyway, you want the best looking leaves. They contain caffeic acid, which has antioxidant and neuroprotective properties. And even the stems are said to be good when they're cooked. Although I haven't exactly tried that myself, but I think I'm gonna take this one home and try it. And you can see, this is multi-branched. From this node here, you've got one coming up there and two branching from here. So it's quite the size. Okay. Now, the flowers, of course, have been used medicinally and as tea for a very, very long time, meaning hundreds of years, actually. These are basically, I don't know, you'd want to use these just for tea. Um, and, of course, the leaves can be used in a tea as well. And I believe I actually saw something that the roots can be used as well for tea. But I'll stick to just the leaves and the flowers. Anyways, these leaves are reported to have tannins, flavonoids, choline, resin, vitamin C, and mineral salts. And for sure, once in a while, I love to have a cup of tea made with this. Check that out. Doesn't that look really nice? The flowers and the leaves are infusing in a cup of tea. And I'm going to enjoy a cup. And I truly hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. Please share in your social media. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. All the support that you've given me over the years. I'm truly grateful to each and every one of you. Thank you.